For everyone joining in our digital worship service, let me call us to worship with these words from Psalm 5. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, O Lord, I will enter your house. I will bow down in your holy temple, in awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your path straight before me. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you for the gift of this day and the gift of this time to be gathered. Thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ who have gathered here for worship, uh, those who are here in our area who um, uh, you know, aren't, aren't able to come to campus, those who are joining us from around the world. Lord, you are opening up new doors in this time and expanding our idea of what it means to be the church. And so as we gather in worship, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will connect us through the ties of technology. Um, we just pray that uh, we would truly feel your presence as we gather in your name. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would use this time to guide and direct our hearts and minds, guide and direct our steps, help us to walk in wisdom and in truth, Lord. Help us to be a light in this nation and in this world that is hurting so deeply, so many raw feelings and emotions, uh, so many issues and concerns, hurts and heartaches around us. Help us to be your people, your hands and feet in this very unique time. And Lord, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to be gathered. Lord, uh, we have never stopped worshiping. And we, it may look different, it may feel different, but we give you thanks for the privilege and honor it is to gather and worship, to be in a country where we can worship without fear of uh, persecution for our faith. And uh, we just pray your blessing on our nation, on our world. Pray for your protection, pray for healing, pray for peace. And uh, we just pray that you would move and that you would use us in that movement. And we pray these things in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
are we supposed to believe? I mean, really. Have you noticed that our world is full of opinions? And not opinions that are in agreement, conflicting opinions. For every issue, there are two sides, two, well, <laughs> at least two sides. Many distinct points of view. Who's right? Who's wrong? Where is the truth? Is it in one perspective or another or perhaps somewhere in between? What are we supposed to believe? Friends, I think we are at a critical point in human history. There's an opportunity, a unique and profound opportunity for Christians to lead from a place of hope and blessing. And it's critical. But how do we do it? We, we need to do it. We have to do it. The world needs a different path right now. How do we do it? How do we know what to believe? How do we know the way forward? That's what I want to talk about this morning as we continue in a series that I've called Coping with COVID. You know, we recognize that whether or not you e ever contract the virus, and I prayerfully hope you do not, but even if you don't, this pandemic is significantly affecting our lives, our society, and our world, our mental, spiritual, emotional health and well-being. And so as we seek to be the light, the hands and feet, the salt of Christ in this world, we need to be mindful of the realities around us and the things that we're experiencing. And so this morning, I want to spend a few minutes talking about how do we know what to believe? How can we bless the world by believing the right things and having the, a right and true perspective? And to look into this, I want to turn to a passage of Scripture today from uh, 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 2 Corinthians chapter 10, written by a man named Paul, the Apostle Paul. And one thing we remember about Paul is Paul had a radical transformation in his life. Paul went from believing one set of precepts to 180 degrees, believing something else. He went from going to Damascus to execute Christians to becoming perhaps one of the arguably most profound New Testament scholars and writers. He, he wrote the, most of the books in the New Testament, so I would say there's a pretty strong argument he was one of the most profound New Testament scholars in Christian history. That's quite a transformed experience and perspective. How did Paul know what to believe? How did Paul come to learn what was right and what was true? How to shake off the cobwebs of confusion and misinformation and get to truth? Well, he gives us a glimpse here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul writes, and starting in verse 3, For though we, Christians, live in the world... We do not wage war like the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. The weapons we use in, in battle, in conflict, in conversation, the weapons we use have divine power to demolish strongholds. One stronghold for Paul was that Jesus was a fluke and uh, all of people who followed him were causing a problem and he was going to Damascus to kill them. Along the way, something demolished that stronghold, that strongly held belief that Christians were wrong and they were a problem. Verse 5, Paul says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once obedience is complete. Paul says a lot of significant and important things uh, in these uh, short verses. A lot of, in my opinion, very timely wisdom for us. And so I'd like to spend a couple minutes uh, today going through this passage of Scripture verse by verse and looking at each point Paul makes. First of all, Paul says in verse 3, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Even though we have a shared experience with the rest of humanity, we are not supposed to act and behave as the rest of humanity does. 
You know, I've noticed that as our world is at war or at conflict with a significant diversity of strongly held positions, uh, there's two primary temptations that I face and I think many others face. One is to give up, just not get involved. It's too overwhelming, too obnoxious, too ridiculous. There's uh, so much nonsense, so much misinformation, so much miscommunication, so much misunderstanding. The idea of helping the world, changing the world, seems almost fruitless and impossible. Not to mention that most of us in this unique time have an inordinate amount of stuff on our plate. We're trying to survive and manage in new ways, continue to do our, our roles and our ministries, our occupations, manage our families uh, in, in very new and challenging times. So to think of all these other issues and how we can be involved, one, is, one temptation is just give up. It's, don't be involved. Stay out of it. The other temptation is to fight like they do. Right? Just join the fray. People are online saying mean, nasty, ugly things. People rioting. People arguing. People screaming. People from all perspectives demonstrating what they believe in sometimes very violent ways. Many times we've seen mean, nasty, name-calling, egocentric perspectives, people focused on their opinions and, and their desires only. They don't want to hear what anybody else has to say. And sometimes it's tempting to jump right in there, to get angry, to be offended. We hear mean, nasty things about what we believe, so we want to say mean, nasty things about what other people believe. But look very clearly at what Paul says to followers of Jesus. We don't do that. That's not us. For even though we live in the world, we do not wage war. We do not attack each other like the world does. It's pretty plain, pretty clear, pretty uh, obvious here what Paul believes. We do not fight for what we believe for what we believe in like the world fights for what they believe in. Look what he says. Verse 4. For the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Have you ever heard the quote that when the power of love overcomes the love of power, things will start to change? <laughs> the world loves power. The church believes in the power of love. Christ believed in the power of love. If we are followers of Christ, then we are called to believe in the power of love more than the love of power. And hopefully you can hear there's a plane flying over here. Hopefully it's not too disruptive. All right, I'm sorry. Plane flew right overhead. It got pretty loud. I don't know what it did to the audio. But anyway, uh, talking about the, the, the difference between the love of power and the power of love. You know, so many people are trying to fight in this world for power, for influence, to get things to work the way they want them to work. And yet as followers of Christ, we know about the power of love. And that was demonstrated to us in Christ himself. And I think of, when I think of the epitome of, of this need and, and the impact of love, it was Jesus on Calvary. People were attacking him, attacking what he believed, attacking what he said he was. Well, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. They mocked him, laughed at him. Jesus wasn't giving up at that point in time. He wasn't surrendering. In fact, he was strongly fighting for what he believed in. In fact, he needed such strength to do what he believed was right. We remember the night before that he prayed for that strength. And he was God incarnate. And he was still praying for the strength to do what he believed in. Jesus wasn't giving up. He wasn't backing out of the debate and the issue and the, the, the challenge at hand. He wasn't surrendering. He was actually fighting very powerfully and very boldly for what he believed was right. Now, he wasn't fighting 
the way they were fighting. He wasn't mocking the way the world was mocking. He wasn't meeting their ridicule and their name-calling with r returns of ridicule and name-calling. No, he met their attacks with prayer. God ask, asking God to forgive those who were mocking and attacking him. Now look, here's the reality. That approach is not as satisfying to our sin nature. I mean, why don't Christians just do this? I mean, we say, what would Jesus do? And we clearly have what Jesus would do. Why don't we just love people? Why don't we just pray for people who are attacking what we believe? Well, frankly, it's because we're afraid and because that's not as satisfying to our sin nature. We are much more tempted to fight right back. If they say mean, nasty things about what we believe in, then we, we say mean, nasty things about what they believe And look, there are Christians across every political spectrum and position. We understand that. But when somebody attacks what we believe, do we fight like they do? Paul says no. Jesus demonstrated that's not how we live. That's not what we do. And look, the reality is the only way that we can do this, because it's not as satisfying to our sin nature, it puts a lot of trust in God's power. But then again, look what Jesus did. But the only way we can do this is to have a focus on the outcome. Look what Paul says in the next part of this passage. On the contrary, the way we fight, and I know fight is a, a loaded term, right? We, when we say fight, or let's say when we stand up for what we believe in, when we demonstrate what we believe in, like Jesus did on the cross, he believed that was the right thing to do. It says it has the power to demolish strongholds. What did Jesus do that was so convincing to the people at the, at the foot of the cross at Calvary? Well, he didn't say anything that was convincing. In fact, he didn't say anything at all. The one time that he prayed for them, he did it so in such humble silence that they hushed the crowd and said, shh, quiet, listen, what is he saying? And then what happened? The sky went dark. The earth quaked. The temple curtain tore in two. Rocks shattered. Graves opened. Dead people walked out of the graves. And what happened? The people who were mocking, cursing, and killing Jesus said, Surely he was the Son of God. You see what Jesus did there? He didn't think that he had to win the argument. He did the loving thing and left the victory to God's hand. He trusted God with the victory. One of the reasons we have such a hard time you know, loving people who are offending us, who are attacking us, is perhaps we're not trusting God to bring victory. We're not trusting God with the outcome. We feel like we need to take control to, to manage this thing to a satisfactory outcome. Jesus didn't, didn't fall into that trap. He trusted God. He did what he was supposed to do, and he trusted God to bring victory in the outcome. When we fight and argue and debate and curse and name call and banter like the world does, we don't demolish strongholds. <laughs> we don't change people's opinions. We don't break them down. We don't have people at the foot of the... If, if Jesus had just argued, if, if he'd have come down from the cross, like they challenged him to do, if he'd have rained down fire, if he'd have started yelling and name calling, he would not have had people at the foot of the cross saying, surely he was the son of God. He wouldn't have changed anybody's opinion. In fact, he would have strengthened them and what they believed. That he was a crazy guy. I, as a coach, I, I um, often talk to my players when they feel like a foul or a call went against them and wasn't accurate and they want to argue with the official. I said, I asked him, have you ever seen an official change his mind because a player or coach argues with him? In, in, in my life, I have never seen an official in any sporting event have a player or coach get in their face and argue and scream and yell and say, oh, you know what, you're right, that wasn't a foul. I'm, I'm going to change the call. Never seen it. In fact, what often happens 
as they get so entrenched in believing that what they saw was accurate that they often give a technical foul or an ejection to the person, the player, the coach who's arguing with them. See, see, that approach has no power to break down a stronghold, no power to change people's hearts. No one has ever argued someone to love. When Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul who's writing this, Paul who's on his way to Damascus to kill Christians, Paul who's writing this to teach Christians, when Jesus met him in the road, he didn't argue him, he didn't smack him, he didn't hit him, he didn't wrestle him to the ground. He simply asked him, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And so we are called to stand up for what we believe in, but do it in a Christ-like way. Well, then what are we supposed to oppose? Look, at, let's wrap this up here. Um, verse 5, it says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Now, look, here's what's important to know about um, this passage of Scripture. Paul is not talking as much about the outward activity of Christianity as he is about the inward activity of Christianity. See, when I say that we demolish, when Paul calls Christians to demolish arguments and pretensions that set themselves up against God, he's not as much charging Christians to rush out into the world and demolish arguments against God. He's challenging Christians to look in the mirror and ask the question, what beliefs, what convictions, what arguments and pretenses do I have that are actually not what Jesus would do? And this takes a lot of work because, let's be honest, not all the things that we want to be right are right in the eyes of God. And you won't know what opposes God until you know God's word. One of the reasons that Christian leaders are always pushing and encouraging followers of Christ to have a daily reading plan is because it's so critical for us to truly know the character of God, to constantly be in the Word of God, to, to, to study the attitude and the position and the, the sayings and, and the ideas of Christ, the mind and actions of Christ, so that we can emulate them. In fact, if I were to say... <laughs> If there's one thing, if, if Christians really want to choose to, to change the world, if, if Christians really want to make an impact on the world, what could they do? I would say this. They could give up social media for scripture. If, if somebody asked me, give us one thing that followers of Christ could do to make an impact on the world, I would say they could give up social media for scripture. If we traded in our time that we spend on social media, sharing and blasting and, and mis, you know, mixing in the fray for reading scripture and studying the mind and the character and the ideas and the actions of Christ, that would be the one thing we could do to most significantly make an impact on the world. Or at least, if we equaled our time on social media and in dialogues and debates and arguments with the world with our time in Scripture, that would at least be a first step in the right direction. Now, some of, the, some of you might be hearing this. That, that is outlandish. That is crazy. As I said, not everything that we want to be right is right in the eyes of God. And not everything that's right in the eyes of God is right in our hearts and minds. That's why Paul says we must demolish arguments and pretenses. We must examine ourselves. If, if we want to do that, look, you know, if we want to represent Christ, we have to know what Jesus did. And we have to examine ourselves. We have to be willing to be transformed. And look what he says next. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We take captive. We arrest everything we're about to say, everything we're about to do, every way we're, we arrest it. And I know that's a, a sensitive, potentially sensitive term. We arrest it. We take it captive. And before we release our words, our thoughts, our actions into the world, we ask, is this obedient to Christ? Meaning, is this what Christ would do? I think about it. 
sometimes this is very difficult to do. Jesus says things like, um, you know, that we should forgive our enemies. And, and I'll be honest, sometimes there's people who offend me, and I don't want to forgive them. There are people who, who upset me, who have done something wrong to me, I don't want to forgive them. And so they do something to offend me, upset me, and rather than forgive them, I want to return to them what they've done to me. But before I'm about to go and get my retribution, I need to arrest that. I need to take it captive and ask myself that question, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus respond? He would say, pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Forgive those who offend you. And that's not easy. There's a lot of things Jesus tells us to do that we don't want to do. Jesus tells, you know, pray for your enemies. And look, when we do this, we think it's an act of obedience to bless God. All right, we think that when we obey God, it's an act of obedience that will bless God, make God so proud of us. That's not why God tells us to do these things. I've got a newsflash, a spoiler alert. You know, most of the people who offend you, that you're harboring a, a grudge against, that you're angry with, most of those people don't even know you're angry with them. Your anger, your frustration with them, it's not bothering them. Half those people probably even know you're upset. It's bothering you. So when we forgive those who we're angry with, it's not a blessing to them that makes God happy. It's a blessing to us. It releases us. That frustration is much more damaging to us than it is to them. So Jesus tells us to act in that way, and we have a tendency to think, well, well if I do that, that's, that's my obedience blessing God. No, God sets it up so that our obedience blesses us. We're released from that. That's the beauty of obedience. They're not the ones who are blessed. God's not the ones who are blessed. God is pleased, but God is pleased because we live better lives. We live at peace. That's what Paul is saying here. Take every action and make it obedient to Christ. Basically saying, it's a fancy way of saying, what would Jesus do? And, and we think that when we do what Jesus would do, when we live like Jesus would live, it's just to make God happy. No, it's to bless us. Ultimately, we are the ones who are blessed when we live as Jesus would live. And then Paul closes with this. Verse 6, we must be ready to punish every act of disobedience. Again, this is language that he's using that sounds pretty harsh, but um, when, we, when we think of how many metaphors, athletic metaphors Paul has used, if we think of it in the same tone, you know, basically what he's saying is we need to train out our disobedience, right? We, we, you know, we need to discipline ourselves. When we don't want to forgive someone, we need to, just, just as we, um, you, you know, if you have a habit of, of biting your nails and you don't want to do that anymore, you, you want to punish yourself right for biting your nails so you might soak your fingernails in vinegar or something so when you go to bite on your nail oh you get that nasty taste you train yourself right you, you you train yourself with these reminders don't do that that's what he's talking about these little uncomfortable things that that make us better and and we understand that you know growing as a human being is not always comfortable you know uh, we might want to lose weight well that means what more cookies and ice cream and soda and all those foods we love. Okay, that might be a little painful at first, but ultimately it's going to make us better. We might want to get an advanced degree or continue our education or something. Well, that means we might have to, you know, do some things different. We might have to have a little less free time. We might have to do a little more studying, a little more work. We have, we have to train ourselves. We have to discipline ourselves. You know, don't necessarily think of discipline as a punishment as much as a, a regimen. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to practice to improve, to get better, to be healthier, to be more fruitful with our lives. That's what Paul's saying is those parts of our lives that are not like Christ, we have to punish them. We have to train them out. We have to discipline ourselves. You know, if, if, 
if somebody says something nasty to us and our immediate response is to say something nasty right back. You know, they say something about our political opinions, our beliefs, our Christian convictions, our family. You know what? And our immediate response is to, uh, uh, to fire right back with what they believe about whatever topic or, or situation or opinion. Paul says, if that's your response, you've got to discipline. Change it. Practice not doing that. All right, I realize that we're getting long on time here. So, uh, you know, what do we believe? Here, here's a synopsis of what Paul is saying in this text. You know, you cannot hear the voice of God if you're listening to everyone else. You know, if you want to, you know, represent Christ in this time, if we want to know what we should believe, we have got to be tuned in to the Word of God. And look, there are so many other voices. You ever been in a room when the, the radio's on and maybe your, your spouse or your friend or somebody's calling to you or speaking to you and you can't hear them because the radio's on? Right? You want to hear their voice, but you can't because there's so much other noise around you. You know, that's the reality. As followers of Christ, if we want to be serious about representing Christ in this world, then we're going to have to figure out a way to tune out the other noise. There's too much noise in our world, too many other opinions and ideologies and, and perspectives, too much anger, too much debate, too much frustration. If we really want to hear how Jesus is calling us to live and represent him, we're going to have to figure out ways to tune out some of that noise and tune in to the word of God. And so that's my challenge for us this week. What do we believe? Well, look, there's wind and waves of doctrines, every passing idea, different perspectives on what we should do and how we should do it. But there is one source for God's eternal word. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, my challenge for you this week is to figure out ways to tune in to the word, the eternal word, the eternal perspective, and be guided by the love of Christ to show us how we should live and who we should be in this time. Grace and peace to you. Amen.
And now, brothers and sisters in Christ, as you go forward, I pray blessings on your day and on your week. And as you go, may the grace, mercy, and peace, which comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be with you this day and every day forevermore. Amen. Have a wonderful day and a blessed week. Peace be with you.